So on behalf of Shelter Northern Ireland, I would like to welcome you to the Barney Filer Memorial Lecture. The lecture is named after Clarence George Horatio, better known as Barney Filer, who after, after a distinguished career in the military and in the service, and, and in the civil service, uh, helped to found shelter in 1980 and was a leading knight in shelter for some 25 years. Uh, he served as an officer of, in shelter and he was a past chairperson. I would also like to welcome all those viewing the memorial lecture online. For two, uh, uh, you, you two are most welcome and we are glad that you could join us. Uh, some of our members unfortunately cannot be here uh, tonight because of COVID, so we wish them a very speedy recovery. And our past chairman, who, who you may well know, Ray Cashel, also cannot be here tonight. He had an accident at home, so we send Ray our best wishes and again for a speedy recovery. A very special welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Rory Hearn, who's a lecturer in social policy in the Department of Applied Social Studies at Maynooth. We are also holding this lecture, we are holding this lecture in St. Joseph's Church, and it's really uh, quite a magnificent church, isn't it, when you look around? Uh, because, and this part of uh, Belfast is rich in, uh, in, in its history. The working class enclave of Sailor's Town was established in the mid 10th century and was Belfast's first waterfront village. It came into being when Belfast's industry expanded and flourished. Many local men found employment in, as dockers or as merchant seamen. Sailor's Town is associated also with many well known personalities such as James Larkin, who was a trade unionist and political activist, who in 1907 organized a significant workers' strike when employers refused workers' demands for better social conditions and union recognition. Sailor's Town also has a cultural rich heritage. John Campbell, a native of Sailor's Town, published poems about the area and two of his books, uh, Corn, Corn, uh, oh, sorry, Corner Kingdom and Disinherited, are set in Sailor's Town docks. And playwright Martin Lynch's uh, 1981 play Dockers vividly creates Sailor's Town in the early 1960s. And one of my favorite singers, Anthony Toner, wrote a song, Sailor's Town, following a performance in the Rotterdam bar, which sadly has now closed. And, but the, regrettably, much of Sailor's Town is no more. Much of, the, much of it was demolished in the late 1960s to make way for the M2 motorway. However, the docks uh, area has been extensively redeveloped. A combination of private investment and the building of social housing by Clan, Clan Mill uh, has increased the population since 2010, particularly in the Pilot Street area. But all working class areas have their characters, and Sailor's Town is no different. I enjoyed reading about the, the notorious street fighter and bootlegger Buck Alec Robinson. He also he was seen often walking two pet lions through Sailor's Town, and he apparently got them from a visiting circus, and he kept them in his backyard. So we are really pleased to be holding the Barney Fyler Conference this evening in this historic Sailor's Town. But now I have the privilege of introducing Shelter's Manifesto. And then we will hear from our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Rory Hearn. Okay, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we are in a housing crisis. 
social housing waiting lists are at a record high. Almost 44,000 households are on the waiting list compared to 26,000 in 2002. The numbers in housing stress are unprecedented at over 30,000. And households living in temporary accommodation have soared from just under 3,000 in 2016 to just short of 10,000 today. And the number of hidden homes is estimated to be between 70, 75,000 and 136,000. These are people sleeping in cars, squats, and on the floor of sofas with family and friends. And while the numbers presenting and accepted as homeless have reduced over the past year, the special arrangements put in place because of the pandemic have been successful in reducing homelessness. However, these arrangements are only temporary and are to end. We're also living in an economic crisis caused by the pandemic and the Ukrainian conflict. We have seen energy and fuel prices soar, food and other household expenses are rapidly increasing. And the people most affected are those at risk of homelessness and those trying to exit homelessness. In many ways, it's an opportune time to launch Shelters Manifesto, to set out a pathway out of the current housing crisis and to put forward recommendations, if not to eradicate homeless, but to alleviate homelessness and to bring some sort of relief to those who are struggling. The manifesto sets out five key commitments where policy and legislative changes are required. So I would just like to take a few minutes to provide a brief overview of the five key commitments contained in the manifesto. The first commitment is give every household access to a good quality, affordable home in a shared neighbourhood that is appropriate to their needs. And I suppose there is one thing we can all agree on. There is not enough social housing available and insufficient numbers of new build social housing planned. It is a key part of Shelter's manifesto that the Assembly should commit in, to building on an annual basis 2,500 social homes. Building sufficient social housing is crucial in reducing waiting lists and in tackling homelessness. More social housing will reduce the number of low-income households who have no choice but to seek accommodation in the private rented sector, where housing conditions are often poorer, rents higher, and for many, unaffordable. A commitment to building more social housing would also result in significant government savings through the reduced welfare expenditure on private sector housing benefit, which goes to the landlord rather than being reinvested in social housing. There are more other compelling reasons for building more social housing. It would help deliver the outcomes of the program for government. It would help reduce fuel poverty as social housing is built to higher standards and is more energy efficient. Furthermore, social housing built to lifetime home standards would help older people remain independent in their homes and reduce the rising costs of social care. Other key commitments contained in this part of the manifesto are to abolish the housing executive's right to buy, refurbish empty government buildings to provide housing for those on the waiting list, make greater use of developer contributions to help finance social housing, and to bring empty homes back into the housing stock. The second key commitment in the manifesto 
is to strengthen the legislation around homelessness prevention. Shelter welcomes the publication of the homelessness strategy, Ending Homelessness Together, launched earlier this month, with a renewed emphasis on homelessness prevention. In Northern Ireland, there has been no significant change to the homeless legislation since the introduc introduction of the Housing Order 1988. This is despite other jurisdictions in the UK making significant changes to their homelessness legislation, making it more effective in reducing homelessness. For example, in Northern Ireland, home homeless prevention is undertaken on a non-statutory basis through housing solutions. In England and Wales, prevention has been brought into the statutory framework and Northern Ireland should do likewise. Priority need was abolished in Scotland in December 2012, opening access to homeless services to those not formally included in the priority need categories, which includes most single people. Northern Ireland is the only jurisdiction in the UK still offering singles limited help. Shelter calls for the removal of the priority need category. The 28-day rule is another part of the homeless legislation which needs to be amended in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, a person is classified as threatened with homelessness if it is likely that he or she will become homeless within 28 days. By extending this period from 28 to 56 days, it will ensure that practical help to prevent homelessness is provided earlier and for longer. Other recommendations contained in this part of the manifesto relate to amending the definition of intentionality and introducing new temporary accommodation standards. The third key commitment uh, in the manifesto is the transformation of the private rented sector. The private rented sector in Northern Ireland is now of similar size to the social housing sector and has a range of sub-markets catering for students, migrant workers, singles, and other vulnerable groups. It also caters for people in quite different social and economic circumstances. Younger singles aged between 25 and 39 are disproportionately represented and in this sector, there are twice as many households with children. Nearly half of those living in the private rental sector receive some form of housing support, whether it be universal tax credit or housing benefit. The social housing sector in Northern Ireland does not have the resources to meet the housing need of all who are homeless and in housing stress. Therefore, the private rental sector has an important role to play. Nevertheless, the private renter sector needs reform. Shelter welcomes the private tenancies bill, which has recently been finalized as now waiting royal assent. This is the first of several reforms that are required and which have been promised by the housing minister. Other areas which need to be tackled include raising fitness standards and making the sector more affordable. High rents and low incomes are significant concerns for those living in the private rented sector. And to address this, Shelter is recommending that the local housing alliance is raised to the median rent level. Currently, private sector tenants must top up the amount received through housing benefit by between £45 and £134 a month to keep a roof over their heads. This is simply unaffordable and is driving households into poverty and is a major cause of homelessness. Other recommended reforms included in this part of the manifesto are the establishment of new fitness standards, abolition of the shared accommodation rate, which penalizes young people, and the introduction of legislation to strengthen the regulatory standards in respect of landlords and their agents. The fourth key, fourth key manifesto 
uh, sorry, the fourth key commitment in the manifesto is the retaining of the housing executive as a public body with the added ability to borrow from financial institutions. In 2010, the Department of Social Development commissioned management consultants to carry out a fundamental review of the housing executive. The report was presented to the then Minister for Social Development, Nelson McCausland. While the fundamental review was being conducted, a controversy emerged surrounding the way the housing executive managed its maintenance contracts. The dispute with Red Sky received considerable public attention in the media. Furthermore, in 2014, the DSD appointed management consultant Savills to carry out an exercise to assess the extent of future repairs and maintenance required to housing executive properties. The report found that 6.7 billion was required over the following 30 years to maintain its housing stock. But crucially, there was a funding gap of 100 million in housing executive finances. And without the ability to borrow, there was the prospect of a large, a large proportion of the housing executive stock being mothballed. In 2020, the Minister of Communities announced that the housing executive was to be restructured as a mutual or cooperative, so it could borrow to secure the funding it required. More recently, in 2021, Deirdre Hargy, Minister of Communities, gave a further update on the proposed restructuring of the housing executive. In her statement, she appeared to retreat from previous commitments concerning the designation of the housing executive as a mutual or, co or housing cooperative. The minister explained that all options were being explored, but her preference would be to retain the housing executive without any change if that was possible. It is the view of shelter that the restructuring of the housing executive as a mutual housing cooperative is not a viable model. The problem with the housing executive being restructured as a mutual is that it would be run as a business and would be dependent on private finance. It would not retain a public sector ethos and satisfying housing need would be subservient to making a profit. Tenants would lose their current influence and there would be a loss of democratic accountability and control by elected politicians. A mutual may be a workable solution for a small, medium-sized housing association, but not the housing executive with a stock of 85,000 dwellings and operating in a divided society. It is a view of shelter that the housing executive, if adequately funded, is the best model to deliver public sector housing in Northern Ireland. The fifth and final commitment uh, in the manifesto is to tackle the growing number of households living in poverty, including those with no recourse to public funds. This commitment is arguably the most important of the five. It is well established that poverty is the prime cause of many of our social problems and certainly the underlying cause of homelessness. In line with the new decade, new approach deal, the Northern Ireland Executive agreed to publish a suite of social inclusion strategies, including an anti-poverty strategy. The strategy was due to be launched in December of last year, but has yet to be published. The current child poverty strategy, which expired in 2019, has been extended to May 2022. Research studies have shown that child poverty is the biggest single predictor of homelessness in later life. It is not clear if a standalone child poverty strategy will be published, but it could be merged into the forthcoming anti-poverty strategy. It is the view of shelter that a standalone child poverty strategy is required due to its importance. 
Another major concern for those on in low incomes is fuel poverty. According to the 2016 House Conditions Survey, 22 of all households were in fuel poverty, and households most likely to be impacted by fuel poverty were lows on low incomes. There is no update on the current number of households in fuel poverty, but it is likely that the number has significantly increased. Yet there is no fuel poverty strategy in existence. The Shelter Manifesto calls for a task force to be set up immediately to produce the strategy and come up with ways to insist those struggling to heat their homes. One of the most effective ways to help people in fuel poverty is to adequately insulate their homes. Consequently, a key recommendation in the manifesto is to retrofit housing executive homes and provide means-tested grants to those living in the private rented sector. One of the groups most affected by the current economic crisis is asylum seekers with no recourse to public funds. They are at particular risk of destitution and homelessness. The Shelter Manifesto proposes that a small sectoral partnership approach is taken to end asylum destitution. And among the recommendations in this section of the manifesto include introducing a legal duty to end poverty and establishing an oversight body to monitor the progress of reducing poverty and inequality. This completes the brief overview of the manifesto, which is launched today. So on behalf of the Managing Committee of Shelter Northern Ireland, I commend this manifesto to you and seek your support. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Barney's children, Seamus, John, George and Liz, on behalf of Shelter and I for their continued support. Now, the volunteer housing movement owes Barney a lot, and that's why we're here today, to remember his legacy and his work and to continue the conversation. And on that note, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Rory Hearn. Now, as Robert mentioned earlier, Rory is a lecturer in social policy in the Department of Applied Social Studies. And with a PhD in political and economic geography, Rory has researched and published in academic and policy fields of housing and social housing, housing rights, and um, economic inequality, just to name a few. Rory has also authored and, uh, a number of peer-reviewed journals and books, including Public-Private Partnerships in Ireland, Failed Experiment or The Way Forward, and most recently, Housing Shock, The Irish Housing Crisis and How to Solve It. It's been it's my first trip to Belfast in 12 years. Um, the last time I was here was um, with a project with a community that I worked in in Dublin, in social housing community, Dolphin House. Um, and we came up, we linked with the Participation and Practice and Rights Project. Um, and we went to New Lodge and other areas, which of course have social housing up here, um, and met communities which had similar issues of the substandard conditions of social housing. And when I think back to then, it was something that struck me when I was working then as a community worker um, and through my research, the value of social housing and the importance of social housing. Um, and I think the core reason of why we are in this crisis now, which again is, it's very sad coming to Belfast to see a city in a housing and homelessness crisis very similar to Dublin where I live, um, and that we have our two main cities on this island in probably have the highest levels of homelessness since back to the days of the famine, since before, for hundreds of years we've seen on this island, which is really quite shocking when you think about it, with all the wealth we have um, and all the development. And to see that the big mistake that was made, I think, in both parts of the island was that view which was espoused most 
um, unfortunately, eloquently by Margaret Thatcher, which was there was no such thing as society that, and really, you know, council housing, she viewed council housing as being roots of evil, of, you know, places where people would just become dependent on welfare and, you know, radically reduced the budgets for council housing um, and social housing became stigmatized as something that was a failed idea. Um, and over the last, you know, when we think about it, that's, you know, almost 40 years ago, over the last 30, 40 years, governments not just um, on this island and in the UK and in Europe, America, all took on this idea and belief that social housing was a failed way of doing housing and turned to the market. And I think that is the core reason of why we have this housing and homelessness crisis. Because the market, and I see, saw it today around Belfast, you know, when you talked about private landlords, um, they're not in it to provide affordable housing, to provide proper standard housing. They're in it to provide housing as a profit. Um, the market never has, that's why we've developed welfare states. Um, because the market never provides for those who can't afford to pay for it. And so you always have those who can't afford it excluded. And that is why we developed welfare states after the Second World War that had at their core housing, public housing, public health, public education, a core welfare. And what happened was really housing became the one that was handed back to the market. And I think we need to reclaim it from the market. And we need to say, just as we guarantee people, we don't say to people who, for example, are ill, uh, who have an emergency health situation, we don't say to them, you can't access accident and emergency care because you don't have the money. We're going to send you into some, you know, maybe waiting, you know, massive waiting list. And we'll see, maybe in six years' time, if uh, we can fulfill your need to access emergency accommodation, access healthcare. Now, we do have it. There are inequalities in access to healthcare. But we do generally provide public health because we accept that you can't survive if you don't get it. But housing is as fundamental to people's basic living and needs and as humans as healthcare is, as education is. And yet we leave it up to the market. And I think that's the fundamental lesson we need to relearn, that we need to bring back public housing, social housing, and states need to governments, um, housing associations need to build it again. And I think that's really the core of what I wanted to talk about. I do have a presentation if it's around <laughs> somewhere. Thanks. They're just my uh, brief reflections listening, because I think the, the manifesto is fantastic, and I, I really commend you for developing it, um, and um, I think that, thank you very much, if we get it started, um, the manifesto has a huge amount in it, Password. The college has me locked out of my laptop. There we go. Okay, this worked. Okay. Anyway, well, that's um, warming up. Um, Um, just, yes, in terms of the manifesto, I really uh, commend Shelter in Northern Ireland for um, developing it. I think it's got some really core messages that if we implemented both in the north and in the south, we would absolutely be solving our housing crisis. And it was fantastic to see um, at the core, you know, the idea of maintaining the, the housing executive as a public entity and the importance of that. Because I think... What comes with that is the public responsibility. 
that it is the responsibility of the state to ensure people are not homeless. And I think that accountability has to come back again and that level of sense of responsibility. Um, and I'll talk about that now in terms of it. But again, uh, well done for that and, and thank you for the opportunity to come up here um, and talk about this this evening uh, subject very close to my heart and research. And part of what um, is, I suppose, feeds the problem, what, you know, how have we ended up here, is this idea, and it was, it was um, expressed by very senior government ministers in the South, that the level of homelessness we have is normal, that there is, you know, a level of, you know, homelessness is everywhere. And I think the really fundamental point I would like to get across is that homelessness, and I know everyone here agrees with it, but it's not agreed wider in society, is that homelessness is not normal. There is not a level of homelessness that we should accept um, as somehow normal. And it's important, I think, and what, what I do in my research and work is try and interrogate, you know, where is this coming from, these ideas? And it is, um, it goes back to that belief system and it was expressed by, I know you can't read that, but a senior um, public official who was responsible for dealing with homelessness in Dublin um, spoke publicly a number of years ago, only about three or four years ago, about why people become homeless, was asked about it. And they said, let's be under no illusion here. When somebody becomes homeless, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes years of bad behavior, probably, or behavior that isn't the behavior of you and me. And they said, well, what I meant, they were asked about it, followed up, and they said, well, what I meant was somebody becomes homeless for whatever reason, they're on the street, they're begging, they're behaving in a way that isn't the way everyone else behaves. There's issues, they have health issues, or whatever they have. And I think that that is, for too long, that has been the dominant thinking about why people are homeless that it is something that they did themselves. They're scamming the system. Um, they don't deserve housing. They're different from us. And I think that that belief system is too pervasive within our public bodies um, and within society. And I think we really need to challenge that because it's actually um, part of the problem with this is that it's so our levels of homelessness are tolerated. Um, and then the solution to homelessness is not to provide homes, it's to provide emergency accommodation. It's to provide hostels, it's in shelters, and it's this idea of the undeserving poor. They don't really deserve a home. They need to be, to a certain extent, disciplined. It's the disciplinary welfare state. It's the, um, the welfare state that doesn't provide a home, but provides these situations of living that I will show are actually deeply damaging. And the response is one of charity rather than human, right, human rights response or something that's an obligation. And I think that it is really <coughs> unacceptable that in Dublin, in Belfast going around today, in both cities, the level of the number of people in hostels, you said 10,000 in Belfast, in emergency accommodation in some form. That's not a way to live, as I will show, but I was shocked by the hostels they pointed. I uh, went around Belfast today with the participation and practice in rights project. They, they brought me around to show me different parts, but the number of hostels, it's just shocking, um, and it's not a way to live. And the most important, I suppose, couple of messages that I want to try to put out tonight and analysis is that homelessness is not normal. It's not caused by behaviors. It's caused by our housing market. It's caused by housing policies, and it's caused by inequalities. Um, because all the evidence shows internationally that the dominant cause, and particularly over the last decade, the dominant reasons why people are becoming homeless is because the lack of affordable housing that's available. Um, and these are what are called structural factors. They're not individual factors. These are issues with um, rising rents, for example, um, and I will show housing insecurities. And I think part of the reason that the idea of housing, of homelessness being normal, 
or being the blame of the person themselves who are homeless, is that it takes responsibility then away from policymakers for having to solve or address the structural issues. Um, it removes that responsibility. And it also ignores and denies the contribution of inequalities. Um, because of course people fall into and suffer from addiction, ill health, mental health issues, family breakdown, but that should not be a cause of going into homelessness. And that is not the reason why people go into homelessness. They go into homelessness because their vulnerability is exposed within a market housing system where if you are affected by any sort of issue that means you can't have the income to cover the rent, or you're in some way not able to keep up with rents, or you're not able to navigate the system of benefits, or you're not able to afford a home um, in that way, then you're just excluded. And so your vulnerability in a market-dominated housing system becomes homelessness. And if we had a functioning social housing system and social care system, we, these people would not become homeless. They would be provided with supports, with housing, um, and of course, it also ignores, as I said, the huge number of people who are homeless because simply housing is too expensive. Um, and of course, we know part of the reason why people, people are becoming homeless is because of the lack of tenant protections, which makes them vulnerable to evictions by landlords, um, who for whatever reason decide they want to get in a higher paying tenant, um, and this is part of the structural reason as to why people become homeless. And most importantly, it is, as I said, the lack of supply of public housing. People in the past who would have, who are now being given housing benefit and trying to find accommodation in the private rental sector, in the past, they would have been in social housing, traditional council housing, where they were not a threat of being evicted by the landlord, where they were not going to be evicted by the landlord. And it is a very similar situation we're seeing in Dublin. Another big part of the contribution of the structural causes of homelessness is what is called the commodification or the financialization of housing. And this is the way we've seen over the last 30 years housing increasingly treated as an investment asset, as a commodity rather than a home. And we see um, you know, landlords, property owners buying up property, uh, people's homes, not to deliver a home, but as an investment asset. And I, I understand what you, we were saying about the private rental sector, you know, being needed to provide people's homes, but I think there is a real, for me, a fundamental problem when we've come to rely for our social housing on a housing sector that is about profit. And I think there's a fundamental contradiction there. And of course, I have no problem with the private rental sector and people you know, having homes uh, that they rent out and people rent them and need them at different points in their lives. But I do have a problem when it becomes so dominant that it stops people from accessing affordable homes and that it becomes so dominant that we, and we rely on it for our social housing. I think there's a fundamental flaw there in our approach to the private rental sector. Um, and the private rental sector, I, I think you said possibly is now, you said as many, is housing as many people as social, in social housing. Um, and I think that's a problem because particularly when in the North and in the South, the private rental sector is not like the private rental sector in Germany, which has its problems as well, where it's secure, it's of decent standard, people can live in it as homes. From what I've been told in, in Belfast in the north, it's the exact same as the south. The private rental sector is very poorly regulated, the for-profit one. The rents are too high, they're unaffordable, it's substandard conditions. These are not homes, and we should not be providing people who need social housing as this is their form of housing. And I think that that really has to change. We need to move away from that type of private rental sector, which is for profit, is substandard, is unaffordable, um, 
and actually deliver affordable homes. There is another wider issue which I'm not sure to what extent it's happening up here, but we have it in the south, is the problem of now global investment funds are buying up significant parts of housing, um, of developing new uh, apartments in Dublin, which are absolutely unaffordable to most people. They have access to global wealth funds, so they literally have trillions to go buy up homes, and that is part of the issue as well, because when we see a home coming up for sale, um, who can buy it? The person who has the most money. Who is that? It is a landlord with a lot of money. It's not the person who gets a, a, you know, a low-level mortgage. Who is, they can't compete. Um, and even more so, the investor funds who have access, as I said, to billions and trillions, they can now bid the person who's seeking to buy a home and they buy it then and rent it out, and the person who's looking to buy a home is just stuck renting then, paying their lifetime income to an investment fund or a property investor or a landlord, and we see inequality in society grow and grow further. And I think that's hugely problematic. Um, and I think, I was looking around at Belfast and seeing the vacant sites and uh, being showed them, and I think it, you really need to be careful. I know the student accommodation been built uh, by um, investment funds, again, on a for-profit basis. The land that you have that isn't built on should be building social and affordable homes. It should not be used for global investment funds to make massive profit for generations to come. And I think Belfast needs to be very, very careful about that. And it should be using its land, as I said, for affordable housing. I wanted to talk about the impact um, it's conscious of my time, um, of emergency accommodation on people in homelessness. Because when we look at the response to homelessness, both here and in the South, emergency accommodation, the provision of emergency accommodation has been the primary policy response. Um, but that is hugely problematic because homeless accommodation, while is essential to provide an emergency response, when it moves from being an emergency response, which is someone is in it for two or three weeks, to living in emergency accommodation for three months, six months, a year, two years, then it is very, very problematic. And in particular, for children and families, but also for individuals. Um, and I was talking to, with the Participation Practice and Rights Project, I met some homeless families and individuals today. I spoke to them um, and was talking to them for quite a while. And one of them, after a while, talked about um, actually you know, feeling suicidal um, because they couldn't see any hope, been stuck in emergency accommodation for month after month, and just seeing, you know, where, where am I going? And, you know, that is a deep level of trauma that someone is, is being caused. And, there's different factors, but a primary factor is that being left in situations which are, um, there's no end in sight, and so there's no hope. People feel hopeless. Um, I did research with homeless families in Dublin, um, participatory research, and I think this is really important, um, and it's something that both, I think, NGOs, charities, and the public sector needs to do a lot more of which is involving people directly affected by homelessness in service analysis, in provision, in monitoring, in engaging, in understanding what is their experience um, of services and how things need to change. And uh, what I found was a number, what we, myself and Mary Murphy, we did the research in Minute, we found that there was a number of things going on, and I, I'm sure it's similar here as well. The first was these families became, were evicted from the private rental sector. And they were evicted because um, they were either evicted or they, they went from a situation of overcrowding at home, they could no longer live there, they tried to get private rental accommodation, um, but they were discriminated, landlords did not want them did not respond to them, they were lone parents, they were migrants, um, and they were basically unable to get access to private rental accommodation. And then when they were in emergency accommodation, they, they said the stigmatization, the discrimination became even worse. 
So it was even harder to leave because they, the, no landlord wanted to take them on when they were in a homeless accommodation because there was an assumption there must be something wrong there. So they were getting stuck in emergency accommodation because the only way out was the use of a benefit payment which we have um, down in the south. The other um, issue is around this, this concept of um, what's called ontological security. And it's, it's a psychological term which refers to our sense of feeling secure in ourselves. And when you're in a situation, and it's about having control over yourself, control over your life, control over your surroundings. And if you don't have this sense of ontological security, it causes severe stress to you. Um, and it can affect your mental health and your physical health. And if we think about it, people who are in emergency accommodation have no sense of ontological security. They're living with a deep sense of insecurity. And it's not just in emergency accommodation, but people who are these hidden homeless that you talked about, you know, the people who are couch surfing, people who are overcrowding, they're in housing insecurity. Um, they're living in a form of permanent chronic stress because they can't see um, where are they going to have an actual home of their own um, and they don't have control over their own space. And if you think for a minute, you know, what does that mean? Like, most of us go home, we walk in the door of an apartment or a house and we throw the keys down, we put our feet up and we just sit there. No one tells us what to do. Well, okay, my partners or whatever, but... You know, the principle, generally we work things out and we, but it is our space. We can decide to sit there for the next 12 hours and no one will come and tell us, you have to turn off the TV now, it's lights out. Um, we can put our wallet on the, um, the counter and assuming your kids don't rob from it, no one else is going to take it. Um, you can have a Barney with your kids and no one is going to be looking at you going, are you a good parent or not? Uh, do I need to call social services? Um, these are the experiences that we have versus if you're in emergency accommodation, you can't leave your wallet down, or not just emergency accommodation, but temporary, um, the hostels, even emergency accommodation where you might be in your own room, but um, you don't know how long you're going to be there for. And so all these things impact on us. And one of the things in, in emergency accommodation that we found with our research, that it was a form of institutionalizing the families, the parents, particularly the parents. These were in settings, and, and I was struck by, um, there was a phrase, I think, I think in the homeless um, uh, consult, the consultation by the executive, that they would try and create improved family accommodation uh, better than, I think, emergency accommodation. There is a real danger in the, in, um, in the South, we did this. We moved families out of hotels into what are called family hubs. And these are essentially congregated sort of settings of where people are in their own room, but they share kitchens. And there might be 30 or 40 families who are homeless in that situation. That is not an improvement. Um, that is still a situation where um, and children will talk about it because someone obviously has to manage it. And because it's a sh shared place where children are, there has to be really strict rules over child protection. So parents have been in, in, in the kitchen, the child has been in the bedroom, and someone who's working for a housing organization who has to make sure everything is okay is going, you can't be in this kitchen, you have to be in the bedroom with your child because you can't leave your child alone. Um, and the parents described that it feeling like prison, that their parenting was been monitored all the time, um, even their authority been taken away from them, this sense of being infantilized, you know, been treated like a child. Um, and again, this is deeply impacting. And rather than, you know, people who are in these vulnerable situations who are made homeless, rather than thus helping them out of that, we're further damaging them and reducing their potential and capacity to be able to, to live their life by leaving them in emergency accommodation for long periods of time. 
And in particular, I want to talk about the impact on children um, of emergency accommodation. And homelessness is um, described as what's called an adverse childhood experience through um, trauma-informed theory, which means that it is an experience that can lead to lifelong impacts, potentially, doesn't obviously always, but can potentially negative outcomes in, up into adulthood. It can have developmental impacts, mental health impacts. Um, and I worked with a child psychologist with the, um, the families, and I got, and they analyzed, you know, looking and talking to the children um, about the impact. And what they described was, um, they said, you know, if you, if you take emergency accommodation that's, or severely overcrowded housing, which is important as well, where space is limited, this can have a detrimental impact on babies as a lack of space impedes their natural curiosity for exploration and therefore delays or inhibits meeting developmental milestones such as crawling. It can also affect toddlers, school children who've no suitable place to play or complete their homework, as well as, as older children, in particular teenagers, who've no privacy for sleeping or study. And if we think in particular like teenagers, even children from five, six, seven years up, sharing bedrooms with adults like in emergency accommodation, in situations of overcrowding, like that's not um, suitable for you know, proper healthy development of, of children. And one of the, the homeless families today said to me, um, she said she's in a form of, um, uh, she's an asylum seeker who's got her status here, and um, she has been given a form of accommodation, which is her own door. It, it's a house. Um, but she said that her child was at school um, and was told by other children who were asylum, children of asylum seekers that they were being moved around with little warning by the whatever housing um, company that was managing their accommodation. And she said that they were, she was told that a month or two, and, and obviously they, her and her daughter have had to you know, go through that process of a number of moves. And she doesn't know how long she'll even be in this home because, again, it's not a, a permanent home. It's a temporary one. Um, and so she said her child every morning wakes up and asks her. Every morning the child wakes up and says, do you think we'll be moved today? Like, if you think, like, that's it. Sorry, I'd say the child is eight. You know, an eight-year-old child, every morning, the first thing coming into her head, do you think we're going to be moved today? Like, how, like, it must affect that whole child's life, thinking, and that sense of, as I talked about, the ontological security being affected by a deep sense of insecurity. Um, and that will be with that child, hopefully. Uh, it won't have a major impact, but it could. Um, but we should not, that's, that is not, I think anyway, tolerable in a, in a massively wealthy societies that we put children uh, through that level of insecurity. Um, the psychologists also describe that children need a place to go where they have personal belongings that give them comfort and enjoyment and where they can develop a self-identity. In emergency accommodation settings, children's capacity to express themselves and be themselves is limited. They're unable to bring with them their treasured belongings and must curtail their personal expression and development. And this is really important as well because part of child development is actually simply being able to have your own space, your bedroom, where you gather all your little treasures and teddies. And if you think back to when you were young or if you have a child, you know, that's what children do. They gather their seven teddies and their ten little pictures and they have their little space. And that, in a way, is that's what they need because that's how they express themselves. Their brain develops and is developing in a way um, through that, and they can be themselves and express themselves. But if they're in situations of overcrowding, where you have multiple, you know, generations of families, maybe siblings of, you know, with children, it's this process. They can't really express themselves. They can't really be themselves, and even more so in emergency accommodation. And a child not being able to be themselves curtails their development. Um, 
and inhibits what they can be. And it's just, I think, a horrific thing that we're doing simply because we don't provide a home. Like, it's, it's just, I think it's so wrong, um, and we should be, uh, I think, really um, eliminating completely child and family homelessness. Um, obviously, individual homelessness as well, but I think at an immediate start, eliminating that very quickly. Um, I'm conscious of my time, um, so I will go on. I have this other um, uh, um, accounts there you can read of people who are in uh, homelessness and their own description of it. Um, interesting one I wanted to talk about as well is that um, in, in terms of homelessness, I interviewed, if some of you might be familiar with this book, The Spirit Level, uh, by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, um, a book that's uh, really groundbreaking about the impact of inequality um, and how equal societies do more better. But I was interviewing him for my podcast um, and talking to him about specifically homelessness, and I was really struck by what he said. Um, he talked about what are called the psychosocial impacts of homelessness on self-esteem and dignity of those who are homeless. And he was interesting, and it goes back to what I said at the start, because he said, he said, I think the kind of self-serving theories the rich have about their superiority and also about the failings of people at the bottom is that the rich see that the rich see in people who are poor and homeless, they see that as kind of, well, they're inferior. They're lazy, they're stupid, and it justifies the rich persons, the persons privilege, their position in society. They got it because they're not stupid or lazy. Of course, completely discounting the privilege that was, was put them in that place. And also sometimes luck and chance, but it's not because someone is lazy um, or stupid. It's why they're poor or they're homeless. But he made the point that, that's, that that thinking in society and that, what he called, that status inequality that actually people who are homeless or poor, they internalize that. And he said that this is, these, it, what he describes, he said, this is what makes these forms of deprivation so painful. He said that when you talk to someone who's homeless, it's not just the physical discomfort of the sleeping out or the coldness or not having proper accommodation. It is feeling that your life has collapsed and you are regarded absolutely as the dregs of society looked down on by everyone. And he said, people have failed to see how important the psychosocial effects of inequality are. And I think that's really fundamental because in the, the homeless families I've worked with um, and even others who are you know, affected by the housing crisis that um, I've tried to highlight, I've really been struck over and over by the level of shame and stigma and I'm like, why do you feel shame and stigma? Just, this is disgraceful, this is wrong. But then when you go and see, of course, they society tells them you've done something wrong, you know, that this is really your fault. It's, it's not a structural problem. And so therefore they internalize that. And I think that's what's so important with the work of, you know, organizations like Participation, Practice and Rights, um, and homeless organizations who do involve those who are homeless in speaking out and empowering them to say this isn't right and to be voices in the media to empower them to say you know we shouldn't be ashamed of this this is not our fault this is a structural societal problem of inequality of policy failure it's not our fault and I think for me that is one of the most important things we have to do in working with people who are affected by homelessness and housing is to work to empower them to to see that this isn't their fault. This is a societal problem, and you have a right to a home. And it's what I loved about the, the Shelter Manifesto, that it said very clearly in it, um, on the first part, said, the first demand was to give every household access to a good quality, affordable, sustainable home in a shared neighborhood that's appropriate to their needs. I thought that was really important, to give them a home. They are entitled to a home. We have this idea that they're not, but they are. Because for a functioning society, everybody needs to have a home. Just like they need to have access to healthcare, just like they need to have access to education. You know? and, and I'll finish just by saying that 
Um, housing is a human right. It's an absolute human right, like health and education. And I think we need to treat, we need to get our policies and our responses driven by the right to housing and what that means. That housing is secure, affordable, of decent quality, and everybody needs to have it delivered, guaranteed, responsible by the state, done in different ways, but absolutely that is the responsibility of the state um, to deliver that housing as a human right. And I have lots of other slides there um, which you can put up, but there are there principles which the United Nations has developed for how you can deliver housing as a human right. Um, very key ways in doing it. And it starts by including uh, eliminating homelessness, involving those who are affected in, in monitoring and implementation, in putting in place the right to housing in the law. As far as I know, there's no right to housing in legislation in Northern Ireland. In the South, I'm involved in a coalition trying to get a right to housing put in our constitution. I think it should be in the constitution. It should be in our laws that everybody has a right to affordable, secure, decent standard housing, and it is the obligation of our governments, our states, to ensure they have that. Um, and that's what we'll, and I will continue to work for, and thank you to all of you who do work um, on homelessness and with those who are homeless to end it. It is uh, one of the most important jobs um, anyone can have, and I do believe um, as my slide on Finland showed, we can end homelessness. It is not normal. Um, Finland has radically reduced it by providing homes first. That is what we need to do, permanent homes, secure homes, um, and hopefully one day on this island we will have no homelessness. So thank you very much.